Well, good evening. We're going to begin with the hymn number 64, please. Hymn number 64, page 201. There is no name so sweet on earth, no name so sweet in heaven, the name before his wondrous birth to Christ, the Saviour given. We love to sing of Christ our King and hail him, blessed Jesus, for there's no word ye ever heard so dear, so sweet as Jesus. Hymn number 64 will stand as we sing. Let's stand together. Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please, and let's still our hearts. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the Lord Jesus Christ. And truly, we know those that are believers tonight can say we love to sing of Christ our King and hail Him, blessed Jesus. We love to sing the praises of the Lord. For, oh God, we realize that Christ has done so much for us. Oh, we don't deserve the least of the mercies or the truths which thou hast given unto us. And yet we are so thankful that thou hast lavished thy goodness, thy mercy, thy pardon upon us. And we rejoice that Christ left heaven's glory, came to this wicked world of ours. Oh, yes. We know of our sin, we know of our lawlessness, our, our rebellion, our unworthiness. And also, oh Father, we realize that we deserve every condemnation. We deserve the fires of hell. And yet, no, we thank thee that Christ died upon the tree. We praise thee that Christ died for our sins. Christ died for the ungodly. And truly, when we think of all that the Savior has done, in the shedding of his precious blood, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all 
their guilty stains. When we think of what Christ has done, truly we can hail him, blessed Jesus. And we do pray that in everything that is said and done in this time tonight, that Christ would receive the honor, Christ would receive the glory, Christ alone would receive all of the praise, for he is the only one worthy of it. And, O oh God, we thank thee that our blessed Savior, after going to the tomb, how we rejoice that tonight the tomb is empty, how we rejoice that our Savior is no longer dead, but he is risen from the dead. He has ascended up to the Father's right hand. We, we rejoice that our Savior ever liveth to make intercession for us. And as he said from his own lips in Revelation 1, I am alive forevermore. How we praise thee that because our Savior lives, that we also have the promise of a resurrection and everlasting life. We praise thee that he lives in the power of an endless life and because of that, that we too, that are believers, will also one day live in the power of an endless life. And how we rejoice that we are not looked upon in any goodness of our own, for we have none, dear Father. But we thank thee tonight we are accepted in the Beloved. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And, O oh God, we thank thee for each one that is saved tonight, and they know they're saved, and they know heaven is home, and they're rejoicing night and day as they walk the narrow way. But, O oh Father, we're conscious that there will be those tonight that hear thy word, and they still don't have that certainty of redemption in their hearts, and they need a Savior, they need Christ, they need redemption. Oh, Father, challenge their hearts to their need of thee. And we ask that they would taste and see that the Lord is good. But, oh, Father, we thank thee for the gospel bus meeting that has now gone into eternity. We thank thee for all of the boys and girls that heard thy truth already this evening. Save souls among the children. We know that our Savior had a heart for boys and girls. Suffer the little children to come unto me, he said. And we pray that thou bless the young people, save them at an early and a, a tender age and make them trophies of grace and enable them to go on mightily for thee, to grow into great men and women of God. But, O oh, Father, bless us now. Bless thy servant that will minister to us. Fill him and thy people with thy Holy Spirit. And we ask that this will be a wonderful, a blessed, a, a, a privileged time. As we say, we were not just here gathering with one another, but here tonight we met with God. Oh, Father, meet with us. Send thy spirit to meet with us, we pray. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 65, please. Hymn number 65, page 202. Fairest of all the earth beside, chiefest of all unto thy bride, fullness divine in thee I see, wonderful man of Calvary. Hymn number 65, standing as we sing. Let's stand together. Wonderful man of Calvary, a man of Calvary. 
that's wonderful singing. Now, once again, it is our privilege to welcome Dr. Douglas in our midst tonight. And I know that our souls have been truly blessed Sunday evening, Monday evening. And we do look forward to what the Lord has to say to our souls tonight, even through his servant. You're very welcome, Dr. May I thank Mr. Henderson again for his kind words of welcome. And it's a joy to be present with you in Money Slain to have the opportunity of bringing the word of the Lord. As most of you will know, we intend to concentrate these nights on the early chapters in the book of Judges. I don't know if you've taken occasion in the past uh, to scan these pages or even studied them, but I believe that we have the Holy Spirit of God as our companion to take us through the studies, and therefore we value the seasons of prayer, and I have indicated to the friends here, I intend to be present every night for the prayer meeting beforehand because I believe in prayer, and also I I really rely on the prayers of God's people as we seek to bring the message. I, I, I do not advocate prayer simply because I'm a minister, and it is expected of me to do so. But I urge the saints of God always to seek God's face earnestly in prayer, because I rely on the prayer support of the people of God. God answers prayer. We're encouraged by that. And I'm glad to see you this evening. We have our subject in Judges chapter 2. Not quite sure whether we will continue the subject again tomorrow night. Really, that matters in the Lord's hands. But ahead of us, I intend to look at the presence and the operation of the Holy Spirit in the book of Judges. And that's an important aspect of uh, this inspired history, to see how the Spirit of God himself took up uh, the work, and by taking up the work, kept his hand upon his people, and upon the word that they brought. So it's a privilege always to gather, as we do, around the word of God. And I'm glad to see you tonight. If you have other friends who might be interested, do extend a word of welcome to them. Tomorrow night, while I've said I'm, God willing, going to be at the prayer meeting every night, that applies to tomorrow night as well. But there's an element of uncertainty about tomorrow night for Lisburn City, closes down. They have what they call a fun run. It wouldn't be much fun for some of us if we tried that run. And we would quickly find out after a yard or two we're not very fit. But for better or for worse, fun run is on. Roads roads are closing down. So we're going to have to invent uh, as best we can a, a new route to get here. And then we will see just where these closed road signs appear. And already I can see this, the beginning of this work and I've been surprised. Oh, did they put a, a sign of closure there? I didn't expect it there. But uh, so much for the night to come. We're in the Lord's hands. And I'm assured eventually we'll get here. But um, it's my intention to be here just to see him on time for prayer tomorrow night. I'm just uh, making that proviso in case I don't manage tomorrow night and some of you will smile at me and you'll remind me and say, you didn't make it tonight. Well, that, that's the explanation. I'm away with the runners. But of course, I'd rather be in the heavenly race. And then the crown is one that lasts. You see, people who run and obtain a crown and situations where that is the uh, reward for running. some cases it is. I'm afraid the little crown of glory soon vanishes away. 
And we have watched uh, pictures of people rejoicing when they won this great trophy or that great trophy, and they're trying with all their might to enjoy it, but trying in vain because there's no real joy in the world. And the joy of the Christian is the joy that matters, a joy in the Lord and in His Word. So we have that joy, and we pray the Lord will increase the joy and abide with us as we study God's holy word. I thought then to read with you, and you may like to join me. By the way, if I make a reference to somewhere in Scripture, uh, you're not under compulsion to turn up the page and look at the reference. I'll be reading the reference in any case, but some of us, some of us, prefer to have the reference for personal uh, study and by getting that reference uh, to our attention, uh, we can then study the subject at length. Judges chapter 2. Maybe you put a marker in the place for easy reference. For primarily this week, we have thought to arrange this series of meetings with a view to studying the Scriptures, to getting into the Word of God, to get to know the mind of God, even as we reflect on his word. Here we have, verse 1, an opportunity to meet with one who's called the angel of the Lord. And I have asked the question, who is the angel of the Lord? We shall see. The verse says, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal, uh, to book him, and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you onto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Well, the equivalent question is, what have you done? We can take, take both examples when we think about Searching our own hearts. What have we done? That's the way it is here. Why have you done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim. And that Hebrew name means weeping. Thus, they uh, have this kind of memorial for that unforgettable meeting with God that day, the weeping. The word is in the plural to signify, oh, there's a multitude of tears to signify that all of the people, one after the other, great waves of emotion swept over the entire gathering. So it is useful to point out that the expression here is in the plural number to show that it's not just one or two who are affected. But we can see if we were standing there where the elders of the congregation stood back then, we would just see that vast crowd belonging to the family of Jacob, the children of Israel, 
swept up with emotion. Their hearts stirred, overwhelmed in an instant with the word the Lord brought to them. Sometimes the Lord fills our hearts with great joy. And the word of God brings us uh, immense joy in our hearts, jubilation, in fact. We have a hallelujah within, but there are also times of heart searching. And the word of God also ministers to us in that way as well. It's interesting to see that. There it is. They called the name of that place, verse 5. They, they could have gone on without naming the place. Perhaps if some of the characteristics of folk identified with present-day Christianity, they would simply have shed tears and ventured on. There would have been no name ceremony. But you'll agree that there is an occasion for memorializing the place, and they might not forget it. And we can attach ourselves to that point as well, that if the Lord does begin to work within these hearts of ours, we don't want to forget what he has said. We do not want to forget our response to him. Here, with all our weeping, they did take time to memorialize the place that it might remain a testimony for later. They called the name of that place Bochim. Remember, it's in the plural. Remember that that indicates volumes of tears. That people just wept their heart out. It wasn't a mere expression of emotion. And they had finished with it then. No, it, it was overwhelming altogether. And it went from family to family, from tribe to tribe, right through the entire company. And they memorialized the place. I believe God puts these verses in the Bible for a purpose. It's like you remembering the date when the Lord saved you and the place where you were born again. Now, a lot of Christians uh, just didn't know at the time properly to take a note of the date and so have missed that and might be a little worried about my comment there. The main thing is you know you're saved. The main thing is you remember that date with the Lord. The main thing is that day when you trusted the Lord, you became a new creature in Christ. And the old things passed away and all things became new. That's the important thing. But it's an additional blessing if you can say, yes, I remember. I remember the place. I remember the date. That's just the sort of thing what we have here in verse 5. They call the name of that place as if to say we mustn't forget that. If you have an experience with God this week, you'll not want to forget it. Memorialize it. People in earlier days, we nearly call them the olden days, did keep spiritual diaries and they took note of God's gracious dealings with them. A very good idea. It's entirely scriptural. I see it paralleling with this. They call the name of that place as if to say, we'll never forget it. How could you forget it? If in that place and on that day, the Lord himself took a gracious dealing with your soul. And so verse 5 memorializes the event in another way. When they worship the Lord, they're at the altar of sacrifice. They worshiped in the place of atonement. They sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went, every man, unto his inheritance to possess the land. 
and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being an hundred and ten years old. Keep the marker in that place, and if you prefer to do so, just turn across to Psalm 84. We're not going to read consecutively, but we're, we'll select a few verses from the psalm. Psalm 84. And let me pick out verse 1, because that place where we stand in worship is hallowed ground, especially if we do meet with the Lord there. Therefore, how lovely, or how amiable. That's the meaning, how lovely. It's the loveliest place on earth. Hallowed ground, I said earlier. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth. Oh, let it be so, even this hour. That's my prayer. It's my prayer for tonight and for this week. My soul longeth. Lord, intensify that longing. Yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. And then we'll see verse 4. Blessed are they, and you could put in the word happy there, as a corresponding word. Happy are they that dwell in thy house. That man has joy. I mentioned joy earlier. It's strange how emotions can mingle. There may be tears on the one side and then joy to follow. Happy are they, blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. Selah. Selah is the term for pause here. Stop here. Stop for a second and think of that. Think of that. Now, you might effect that by reading the verse over again, you see. Uh, when you're finding the word selah in the course of your reading, quite often in Psalms, but not exclusively in Psalms. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. It's appropriate for you and for me where we're in the house of the Lord, to join in the praise. It will be still praising thee. The house of God is intended as a place of praise. We could do more in that regard. Everything like this where we feel uh, that we're slipping behind a bit, we can rectify it or attempt to rectify it by prayer and say, Lord, help me to praise thee more. And again, we come to this word blessed or happy. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee and whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. Now, that word Baca is related, it's in the same family of words as Bokim. And although the margin here makes reference to the mulberry tree, the reason for that is that in the natural world, this was the thinking way back in earlier days, uh, no doubt it's true if the tree indicated that when they uh, made lacerations in the bark, this particular tree uh, just poured out its sap. Every slit in the bark was like a mouth, and it was compared to the tree weeping, as if there were lots of tears for every wound made in the tree. But at back of that, I say, back of that, you have the starting word, you have the main word, and that's the word for weeping. Isn't it interesting? 
in this lovely psalm about God's presence and fellowship with God and happiness in the courts of the Lord, isn't it an interesting thing uh, that we may have to walk the valley betimes? And sadly, it's a valley of weeping. But I'm also thrilled to pick up on other words in verse 6. If you can find them there, and of course you can. Passing through. Remember this. Even though you are in anguish in the valley, and you wonder if you can survive at all, just remember this. You're passing through the valley. The Lord's not going to allow you to stay in it. But as you enter into the valley, sometimes the Lord calls his own people to walk through the valley as a testimony to the ungodly. A man who doesn't know the Lord. If a Christian never had trouble, if a Christian never shed a tear, that ungodly person might say, oh, what do you know about trouble? Sure, you've never had to drink of this cup. But there are times when the Lord even allows his people to tread the valley. And they're passing through because it's better on before. The clouds will vanish. The sun will shine again. And then... God says, why all those tears? Make it a well. There will be a, a fountain there. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them. No matter about their grief or their tears or their hardship or their struggles or their weakness, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Now the prayer rises to fullest expectation. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. And then that word again. You remember what we said about it? Selah. Just pause there. Read it again. Behold, O God, our shield. We need the shield when we're in the valley. Lord, throw your arms round about me. Hold me close to your heart. That is our prayer at such a time. Look on the face of thine anointed, our Savior. Look on him, Lord. And then verse 10. Do you see it? It's like a little corner of heaven. We've gone through the valley. We've been passing through the valley. We have suffered the grief. We may have shed the tears in our loneliness. And then it says for a day, just even one day. And the Lord's promised much more than that. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God and to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And that's why I've said it's, it's like a weak corner of heaven. The Lord can make it up to you. And when you're praying, reading God's word, hold on to the Lord with that prospect in view. For the Lord God is a sun. There's the sunshine of the best kind and shield. The Lord will give grace Yes, you need it, and you need it in abundance. The Lord will give it. The Lord will give grace and glory. Some people like alliteration. By alliteration, I mean they gather up two or three words with the same initial letter, and it helps them, they tell me, it, it helps them to remember the sequence. And you look at the letter G here. There's grace. There's glory. And then there is the good thing. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And finishing off, O oh Lord of hosts, happy is that man 
Blessed is that man. Trusteth in thee. Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you have the Bible? Aren't you glad you're here tonight? It's no accident. There are no coincidences with God. And the Lord has watched over our steps, given us health enough and strength enough, opportunity enough to be here tonight. And we have read these words. Could we have prayer? And we'll go back to Judges. But we had Bochim, the place of tears. That place memorialized so that the family of Jacob might have cause to go back again and again and take spiritual account of the dealings of God. And then the psalm with the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping. Bochim was Israel's lot. The valley of Baca, because it's in the Psalms, it may be our portion some of the time. Not all the time. But some days the sun doesn't shine. Some days we enter into the shadow. And can you trust the Lord there, just as in the sunshine? God grant it. Let's, let's pray. Lord, show us thy way. Take us through this passage tonight. We have a desire, Lord. We have a yearning in our soul. We read about it. We have a desire, Lord, to know more about thee. We ask thee to comfort thy people. Comfort every child of God. Maybe someone battling with anxiety. Another with a health problem. And somebody else with a difficulty they have had to struggle with for some time. Lord, we're not alone. But we have thee for comfort, for companionship. And we pray that the Holy Spirit of God will take of the things of Christ. He who is rich in grace and has the fullness of glory, he is the sum of all good. O oh Lord, come by tonight. Visit the congregation. Visit our families, our loved ones, those whose names have gone down in our prayer list. O oh God, come down with power, we pray. Revive thy work. Stir heart. Some of our friends are unconverted. They're still without the Savior. And we ask thee, to speak to those who love thee and speak to those who know not God and obey not the gospel. And may there be signs following the preaching of thy word. Bless us tonight, Lord. Help us, we pray, in our meditation. Grant to this preacher the infilling of the Holy Spirit, even this hour. Undertake for us, Lord. Grant to us just the right word at the right moment. In Jesus' dear name, amen. I have said tonight that the subject for our service is the angel of the Lord. He's mentioned here in Judges chapter 2. I did raise the question before this, who is? Who is the angel of the Lord? And many of God's people already know the answer because they have researched this subject long, long ago. But I wouldn't be sure, certain that everybody has done that. Nevertheless, this is a most important chapter. If we're going to look prayerfully and studiously into the early chapters of the book of Judges, we will want the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We want the promptings of God. And we will certainly want to recognize that chapter 2 in the book of Judges is a chapter that stands out with significance and importance. And my prayer has been that the Holy Spirit of God will take up his word tonight and write it upon the fleshy tables of the heart. The angel of the Lord, men and women, as he's mentioned in the Old Testament in various scriptures, 
The angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We have in an example like this an Old Testament appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The theological term is a Christophany. Christophany comes from the Greek. It's a combination of two Greek words meaning the appearing of Christ. An alternative is a theophany. As you've guessed then, the appearing of God. God appearing. Appearing as a man in the Old Testament. And thus, I say, this is a standout chapter. This is a chapter that must grip our attention. And if it's going to be memorialized by the children of Israel, we say to them, well done, that that meeting with Christ is memorialized. The day you met the Lord ought to stand out, and I think it does. It stands out in your recollection as the day that changed everything for you. You became a new creature in Christ. The old things passed away. All things became new. And you could say, my name is written down in glory. My name is in the Lamb's book of life. I'm as sure of heaven as if a minute. If you're not a Christian, I pray God that tonight you'll close in with Christ, that you'll hear the voice of the Lord as Israel did those many, many years ago, that there might be a breaking up in your heart and spirit and that with many tears you'll come to know the Lord. You don't have to shed tears to come, by the way, but it is an indication, is it not, that there is repentance there. There is sorrow for sin. There is the desire to press on with God in the newness of life. And if you're not a Christian, then I urge you to seek the Lord. There has to be a change. Slowly but surely, your life is coming to its termination. You must, you must look at the question, where will I spend eternity? Where do you stand with God? Maybe you say, oh, there was a time when I trusted the Lord. But to say the truth, I got nowhere. Or you may put it in another way and say, yes, I, I believe I was saved back then, but I'm a backslider. I'm not going on with the Lord. I'm not rejoicing. You mentioned the word blessed tonight and referred to it in the psalm and spoke about happiness with Christ and the joy of God in the soul. I have to confess, I haven't got that joy. How can you have joy if you're not doing right? How can you have joy if you're not walking with God? How can you have joy if you don't know the Lord? You see, the Lord has brought you here tonight. This chapter 2, I say, stands out in the whole book of Judges as a day when the children of Israel as a nation came before God and heard his voice and met the Savior and things were changed. Not uh, changed forever as regards the history of Israel, but changed for that generation. And that's all we can do. We, we can't decide for another generation. If I look at my life, my family connection, and there is that generation leading on to the next generation, my heart's desire is that every single one of them will follow the Lord with all their heart. But that's for them to decide. I'll try to, I'll try to help them to Christ. I'll try to point them to the Bible. But God must deal with them in person. Do you see that here in Judges chapter 2, we have a meeting with God, our Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord should be described as the angel of the Lord. I think it requires me to say this first of all. Many Christians have a fixation in their mind as to the word angel. That is to say, they have already a given view as to what the word means. It goes back to childhood, I do believe. 
And some member of the family, maybe daddy or mommy, taking a little colored book. There's this tiny wee wood on the knee and looking at the pictures and just ravished by all these pictures and eagerly, not waiting for the story to be told, but turning the pages anyway before they rightly can hear the account of what the picture's all about. And there suddenly, there's a picture of one the artist has drawn in beautiful robes. A countenance shining with heavenly splendor. And these powerful wings there. And the voice will say to the child, that's an angel. That's an angel. So from the earliest days of childhood, we get that solidly fixed in our minds that any time the word angel comes up in the Bible, that's the meaning of it. We have a picture of that celestial being, that heavenly created being, sounding there, uh, his garment shining with divine glory. He has come from the heavenlies, from the immediate presence of God. And his face shines with that heavenly luster. And we say, that's an angel. Well, that may be an angel as the artist has contrived to make the picture. But when it comes to word meanings... I might have a surprise for you. That's not the meaning of the word. This word translated angel goes right back to the Old Testament. You can see that even in verse 1 there. Just refer to it so it registers with you. Angel. Angel. There's the word angel. Now, it doesn't mean a created heavenly being necessarily. It could be a created heavenly being, uh, but it may not even be... uh, a heavenly being. For example, in the Bible, uh, a minister is an angel. If you met my wife tonight, you'd be able to get a smile from her by saying, you are, you have reason to smile because you married an angel. And she might have another thing or two to say about me not being an angel. But never mind this. You see, people are angels. Maybe we should turn it up. If you want to turn, that is. If you'd like to turn it up, it'll be Haggai chapter 1. We'll come back to Judges. Well, I feel that's important if we're going to talk about an angel, the angel of the Lord, to have a clear picture in our minds as to what the word angel is all about. Really, I'll step ahead of you and say, The word angel in the Bible, here it's translated in the Old Testament. The word angel in the Bible means a message bearer. So the actual created heavenly beings who appeared to men, for example, the angels who met the shepherds close to the time when the Savior was born, those angels, they have the word angel describing their being, not because of the luster in their countenance or the glow of their garments. It doesn't say in the gospel, Luke's gospel, that they had wings. Angels don't always have wings in the Bible. That is to say, the heavenly ones. But everyone... He appeared on earth, had a message. And that's the important thing, to have the message. Every angel had a message. It wasn't his face. It wasn't the shining of his glory. It wasn't his lustrous garments. It wasn't his powerful wings. It was the message. And we get the wrong end of the stick. There are angels here tonight, angels from heaven in this meeting. The Lord doesn't permit us to see them. And he must not. Because if we saw them, we'd be so consumed with our vision of them. And look at every one of them, their faces, because they're all different. They're just like people. 
They're all different. And we would be overwhelmed with what we saw. We could hardly wait to get home if there's a friend there at home. And we would say, guess what tonight? We saw the angels of God in the place. And there wouldn't even be a word about the sermon. You see, that's the message. We just forget that. That's the way we're affected. If it's something glorious and a way beyond our comprehension, we get taken with that and we miss the message. But the Lord is saying here, it's the message, not the glory. It's the message. And so the Lord must conceal the angels. When the time comes for us to end our days and get to glory, if you're converted, you will get to glory. You'll see the angels for sure. But you'll be you'll be better adjusted in that hour not to make too much of the glory and forget the message. And so the word angel means a message bearer. But is there proof of that? Real, solid, unforgettable proof of that? Yes, there is. Uh, it's in the book of Haggai and in other places too, but I think this is the best place to uh, resort to. Uh, Haggai chapter 1. In fact, this verse will have been quoted ever so many times in your prayer meeting, I'm confident to say. Haggai chapter 1, verse 13. Then spake Haggai, he's the prophet, the Lord's messenger. Now you have it. The Lord's angel. It's the same word in the Hebrew. The very same word. So if you're taking a note, it'll be very convenient for you to write in Haggai 1.13, messenger equals angel. And the other way about, the angel is the messenger. And then you have not only the messenger, but the Lord's message. Now please remember that the person identified as an angel in the Old Testament is spoken of. In the Hebrew language, and it makes sense for me to say, you go to the Hebrew language and you get the meaning of the word there. And that's the critical thing. You start there. That's the starting point. What is the meaning of the word? Uh, You'll say, I don't know any, any Hebrew at all. But you know this. You've been advised tonight, and I think in clearest terms, now, Hebrews 1.13, or rather Haggai 1.13. Then speak Haggai. Now, Haggai is not a created heavenly being. Haggai is an ordinary man who's a servant of God. He's the prophet. He's the Lord's messenger. That's the Lord's business. And the preacher will want to be the Lord's messenger, and that's why he is the angel. He doesn't have any wings. He doesn't have lustrous garments. But he, he is by entitlement, and I hope by conviction, I trust by unction, he's the Lord's messenger. God's message, boy. It's not my message. Sometimes people have thought ill of the preacher. Because what did he do? He presented the Lord's message. In the Bible, and even in history, the Reformation, for example, some of them lost their lives, were martyred, were put to death because they refused to give up the testimony of Christ. They had the Lord's message. And they were staying with it. I tell you tonight, keep Haggai 1 and 13 in mind. In a way, it's like the double whammy in Haggai 1 13 because you have the Lord's messenger. That's the Lord's angel. And then you have the Lord's message. And likewise, message connects with the messenger. And in the sense of being an angel, Haggai is an angel. Is he sinless? No, he isn't. Uh, don't turn this up 
But you may remember seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And the first of those seven letters is to the church at Ephesus. It happens to be Revelation 2 verse 1. And it says like this, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? Who is the angel of the church? He's the minister of the church. He's the Lord's messenger there. It doesn't mean that every church on earth has an angel in charge of it. Otherwise, how do you write a letter to an angel? These are seven letters. Who will be the postman if there's an angel from heaven in charge of every church? Who will deliver the letter? I would like to know. These letters were all delivered. There are seven letters making up uh, the number there in the opening chapters of Revelation. And perhaps you'll remember that now. But every one of them begins with, to the angel of the church, the messenger, the Lord's messenger there. And that's why some of the letters find fault with the messenger. Not with the message, but with the messenger. I have somewhat against the singular number. I have somewhat against thee. Because the Lord's messenger might be at fault. He doesn't want to be. But I must hurry on. It's important then to define the term, the angel. He's the Lord's messenger. He's not necessarily a created heavenly being. He might be, but he doesn't have to be to deliver the Lord's message. A sinner saved by grace can be the Lord's messenger. And if he is, he's the Lord's angel. Isn't that good to know? Well, it's very hard to drive that little thought out of your head that you picked up in childhood. I can understand that. But I'd have you know now that you've begun to search the Scriptures, we must look into the original language to if there is anything that needs adjusting. Very often a tree is a tree, so we don't have problems with every word. But it may be, when it comes to the term angel, you're moving into new ground that you hadn't thought of before. And so it's time to step ahead and say, do I have it in the Bible? Yes, I have. Where is it in the Bible? It's in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 13. The Lord's messenger in the Lord's message. And as long as you live then, if you know that verse, you've got the answer to it. And the Lord appears here in Judges chapter 2, if we can go back to it. The angel of the Lord appears. And I can see now as a sort of thought, I might have to continue this subject tomorrow night. But to me, I, I don't know about you, it's more than worthwhile to define the terms first and get the picture correctly, rather than to have some kind of confusion there, but you want to know exactly what does the Lord mean by an angel. And the angel of the Lord, if you have that title, mind you, elsewhere you can read of an angel, and that may be a created heavenly being. But when you have this distinctive title, the angel of the Lord, that's a reference to Christ. And why should it be? You see, the Holy Spirit of God, and I want to talk about the Holy Spirit in the book of Judges before this series is through. Maybe, maybe, maybe that'll be Thursday night. We'll see. We're in the Lord's arms here. To see the witness of the Holy Spirit. Be clear on this. It's the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. It's the Holy Spirit of God who reveals Christ. That's how I come with confidence. If you're not a Christian and you are willing to take the step this night and come as a sinner to Christ and get right with God, the Holy Spirit will reveal Christ to you as we open the book of God together. It's his office to reveal Christ in the Scriptures. 
And not only so, but it's his office to testify to Christ. So that if I'm the Lord's messenger, and I speak about Christ, the Holy Spirit will be working where I cannot work. I can't work in your heart. But the Spirit of God can be working in your soul this very instant, testifying to Christ as I speak of him. The one who's mighty to save. And it's the Holy Spirit's work not only to reveal Christ, not only to testify to him, to say amen to the word preached by way of testimony, but also to exalt him. Even far above all, have you come to know the Lord? That's the thing. If you were to die as you are tonight, what about your soul? How do you stand with God? Can you read your titles clear to mansions in the sky? You say, oh, I'm sincere, but that's not conversion. You may be saying, I say my prayers, but that's not salvation. Judas believed in God. He's in hell tonight. Judas believed in prayers. He's lost forever in hell. In many ways, Judas followed Jesus, but he didn't follow him aright. The man was false from beginning to end, and he's lost. There has to be reality in conversion. That's why I'm saying, how do you stand with God? Can you say now, if you were to meet with God this hour, that you're ready to go? And if you were to pass out now into eternity, it's a case of absent from the body and at home with the Lord. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for a minute if I didn't know the Lord, if I didn't set myself under God and by God's grace to seek the Lord this very hour. Let me, let me round off why the appearance of the angel of the Lord was necessary in ancient time. I won't expound upon these titles, at least not over much, maybe a little. But the Lord Jesus Christ came as a man on those occasions. He came as the angel of the Lord. In order to give us a preview of his eventual coming into the world. Every time the Lord appeared in Old Testament times, it was a reminder, a visual explanation, if you like, that the day was promised in the covenant of God. The day was guaranteed away out there in the future when Christ would be born at Bethlehem, when he would suffer for our sins and shed his own blood on the tree and die there to make an atonement for sin, we might have peace with God through the blood of the cross. You see, Jacob, for example, you remember reading about him, in Genesis 32, Jacob wrestled with a man. And that's a wonderful passage of Scripture. The man was the angel of the Lord, but Genesis doesn't say that he's the angel of the Lord. You have to leaf over the pages of the Bible to get away through to the book of Hosea before you discover in the book of Hosea that Jacob prevailed with the angel, that Jacob met the angel. Who was the angel in that case? The man whom Jacob met. He was the man Christ Jesus. And his coming into the world was foreshadowed, if you like, guaranteed that the day would come when Christ would appear in human form, in the flesh, to die for sin. He was the man. 
So quite often in the Bible, the angel of the Lord came. It was a way of backing up the promise that Christ was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Abraham's seed after him. And then the angel of the Lord comes, not only to give a preview of his eventual birth, but the angel of the Lord comes to bring his people back to himself. And that's what we have here. That's why we have the tears. Remember reading of the tears tonight in Judges 2, the weeping, massive waves of emotion that swept over that huge gathering, as I say, Why the tears? For different reasons. Mainly, they felt reproached for their sin. Suddenly they had a conscience about sin. A state of a guilty soul in the sight of God. Don't leave it too late, friend, if you don't know the Saviour. You'll be sinking down in death, your sins unforgiven, your soul unsaved. That would be dreadful beyond all comprehension. When you have time now, God has given you time to seek the Lord. And he's going to say to you, just as it is in Judges 2, W-H-Y, that's the question, Why? You remember me emphasizing that in the reading? I hope you do. There we all forget things. And I said, what have you done? Why have you done this? The Lord will call you to account for how you sat that night in money slain. And you knew that what the preacher said was right. And you knew enough of the Bible to point you to the cross and to prompt you to come, but you did not. And the Lord will be saying then, why? He comes here in Judges chapter 2 then, not only to give a preview of his eventual coming, and not only to bring the people back to himself, and I believe he did that, but he will appear also to individuals. In this place in Judges 2, an exception is made because he appears to the whole nation. But as a rule, maybe we'll see in Friday night when I, I'm going to be talking, God willing, that is. We'll be talking about Gideon on Friday night and how he met the man, how the angel came to him. The man, Christ Jesus. And do you know, his life was changed forever when he met the Lord. It's a wonderful feature of the book. God has just foretold and described ahead of time the glorious gospel of Christ. And here he comes, the man, to bring his people back to himself and to relate most of the time to individuals. And that's why in Gideon's case, it was the man, Gideon, who met the Lord. And if you're going to be saved, the Lord won't save 50 people all around you. He'll just deal with you as a person. And then the Lord appears in Shekin, um, as the angel of the Lord to indicate the absence of the Shekinah glory. Because you know enough about the Bible to say to yourself, well, in the days of Moses, the Lord was present with Israel in the shape of the pillar of cloud and fire that we call the Shekinah glory. Because of grief, the Lord departed, withdrew the cloud of fire and glory. And to make up for that on occasions, the Lord would come by himself as the man of sorrows and the man of grace, the man Christ Jesus. And then I say, when the Lord came 
And this is very significant. You've got to keep this in mind. When the Lord came by as the angel of the Lord, it helps the reader to say things were at a very low ebb. It's like the Lord coming on a rescue mission. That's what we have there. Things are at a very low ebb for that generation. It was as if there's nothing, absolutely nothing to be had from God. Not a shred of hope. But suddenly, the man, the angel of the Lord came. He presented the way of life. It's the introduction, really, to the subject, but to me, it's a very necessary introduction because it, it really fills in the blank spots. And it's important if you enter into the study of any theme in the Bible to be perfectly clear or as far as you can in that direction, leaning toward being perfectly clear as to what the Bible actually says. So we can see tonight that our Lord Jesus Christ existed before his birth. We can see that he came into the world and he was prepared to come to individuals in the family of Jacob and the tribes of Israel and he gave to them his precious word and we have obtained his word. Here is the written word. Last night I mentioned the written word of God. How can you become a Christian? If you speak to Mr. Henderson tonight or speak to me or to any friend who knows the Lord, it will be the immediate response. You see this book here? To open to you God's holy word. To show you that the basis for faith is not feeling. But the real basis for faith is what God says. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night in the context of the angel of the Lord. Has the Lord spoken to you tonight? Have you come to know the Lord? Are you going on with God? Is there somebody here tonight? You really would have to say, you haven't been walking for God for a long time. Maybe somebody here tonight say, I'm not a Christian. I don't know. The Lord can see into your heart when I cannot. But I do ask you to seek the Lord while he may be found. That's what Scripture says. Isaiah 55 is about verse 7. That you may seek the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he's near. God bless his word tonight. Mr. Henderson We'll come and close the service. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, please, in the Master's presence. And the Lord has spoken to us tonight, gave a challenging word, an encouraging word, Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee. We thank Thee for what we have learned tonight. We thank Thee for a word in season to our souls. We thank Thee that we have one in the glory that is willing to meet with us. We thank Thee we have one that for those that are saved met with us and caused us to have that time of weeping, that time of conviction, that time of confessing our sin and gloriously saving us. We thank thee for the day and hour when each one here that is saved can say, God dealt with my soul. And, O Father, we do pray if there be one in our midst that hasn't yet known that experience, that they would heed the preacher's warning that they would seek the Lord while he may be found, that they would call upon him while he is near. 
But, oh God, we pray that as we leave this place, we wouldn't be uh, forgetful people, that we wouldn't forget what has been spoken unto us and ministered unto our souls, but that we would meditate upon thy truth, thy law, day and night. Oh God, help us to be doers of the word. Bless us now. Take us to our homes in safety. We once again praise thee for this time in thy presence. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.